Good morning, everybody. I'm Strobe Talbot, and it is my honor to welcome all of you to another of our Jane and Alan Batkin State Statesman Forums. We have a particularly important and distinguished guest and speaker here today, President Widodo of Indonesia. As I suspect everybody in this room knows, Indonesia, as the President was reminding us just a couple of minutes ago, is the world's third largest democracy. It is the world's fourth country in the size of its population. It's the largest Muslim-majority country in the world. It's celebrating its 70th anniversary of independence. I'm getting a nod from the President in each one of these. I feel as though I'm getting a, an exam here. Uh, also, of course, Indonesia was a founding member of ASEAN. It's a member of the G20. And as of yesterday, to the pleasure of the President of the United States, uh, President Widodo made clear that Indonesia is going to support and be part of the TPP. He'll have a chance to talk with some members of Congress on that subject a little later today. President Widodo was elected last October with a grassroots campaign that promised to stamp out government corruption, invest in education, and increase the use of modern technology in governance a subject that came up in his conversation with President Obama yesterday. In his campaign, he made an asset out of his status as an outsider from government, as well as his empathy for the less privileged of his fellow Indonesians. I want to uh, acknowledge two other people who are here. It's a very large and distinguished delegation but I want to particularly thank uh, Ind Indonesia's representative here in the United States, and we call him Ambassador Sonny. Uh, he is a friend of many of us here in the institution and a neighbor on Massachusetts Avenue. And Representative Brad Sherman of California, who is the ranking member of the House Subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific, who will provide some opening remarks before the President speaks. Over to you, Congressman. Hello, I'm Brad Sherman from California's best named city, Sherman Oaks. I'm a senior member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. I. My text here says I should bring you greetings from the world's most prominent dysfunctional parliament. But this week, it looks like we're going to reauthorize the XM Bank, perhaps pass a two-year budget. Our status as dysfunctional is uh, in some question, but I'm confident that we can regain that status in the months to come. I want to thank uh, Strobe, Ta Strobe Talbot for... Uh, bringing us together, uh, recognize uh, Vice uh, President of, uh, of Brookings, uh, Martin Imdick, who just last night uh, joined for dinner and uh, he uh, shared his uh, insights into the Middle East, uh, and of course uh, Richard Bush, the Senior Fellow and Director of the uh, Center on East Asia Policy Studies. It is a particular uh, pleasure to uh, be here with the president of the fourth largest nation uh, in the world, a modern uh, Muslim nation. In 1998, with the resignation of uh, then President Suharto, Indonesia began on an experiment in democracy. Uh, it uh, suffered during the Asian financial crisis. Since 1990, if you were to look at it, Back in 1998, it faced so many challenges, including conflicts involving East Timor, Aceh, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, and the uh, uh, Maluku Islands. Those have been resolved, and a nation that 
began and still has 1,300 separate ethnic identities, which did not have a national language until its independence uh, is now uh, moving forward. Indonesia's young democracy has already provided for a popular direct election of the president three times, and uh, including one where the incumbent uh, Megawati uh, lost, accepted the result, uh, and, uh, and uh, turned over authority to a different party. Uh, Indonesia is proof that Islam and democracy can thrive together. Um, the United States and Indonesia not always had the warmest relationship. Uh, at uh, uh, times, uh, it seemed to be that we were uh, focused uh, only on the Cold War. Although it began rather warmly in 1956 when President Eisenhower invited then-President Sukarno to visit the United States and address a joint session of Congress. And I look forward to uh, you returning to the United States and addressing us again. It is something uh, that should happen at least once every 60 years. Uh, our relationship with Indonesia has ebbed and flowed. Uh, and... Uh, we fell out with Sukarno, we fell in with Suharto, but now we share uh, not only interests, but democratic values. And I think the relationship is on a very solid footing. Um, our economic relationships are just beginning with a trade relationship of uh, $27 billion. That is uh, considerably less. Uh, we export only $8 billion to your country. That is uh, far less than we export to Belgium. Uh, as a matter of fact, one-third of what we export to Belgium. Um, I look forward to that relationship growing, but it's important that it be balanced. Um, right now, it's in a roughly two-to-one ratio, if you include services, uh, where we export $1 for every $2 of imports. But I'm sure as the relationship grows, uh, it will be balanced, and that is something very important uh, to the American people. We've committed $600 million through MCC, uh, the Millennium Challenge Account, which is a strong statement for our uh, dedication and sharing of Indonesia's development goals. I look forward to helping uh, with that as it unfolds. Um, I know that your visit will strengthen our efforts to counter violent extremism, um, and I uh, applaud your efforts to work with the United States and the world uh, against terrorism and for the moderate Islam that comes from Indonesia uh, that demonstrates uh, that uh, uh, Islam is indeed a religion of peace. Um, now, um, Mr. Pr our, our guest, uh, our president, uh, is the... Uh, seventh president of the Republic of Indonesia. He assumed office a year ago. His uh, uh, election was a meteoric rise. He was uh, mayor of a town about the size of uh, Milwaukee, Solo, in central Java, uh, just uh, less than a decade ago. Uh, he then rose uh, to be governor of the state and now president of a country. There is only uh, one other world leader who grew up, to some extent, in Indonesia. He rose quickly from an Illinois state senator to president of the United States in roughly the time it took you to move from uh, Solo uh, to the presidential palace in Jakarta. Now, I know that the uh, president planned to spend more time in the United States uh, our uh, thoughts and prayers are with the people of Indonesia and Southeast Asia as they deal with these uh, heat fires. The United States has committed uh, 270, uh, well, $2,750,000 to fight those fires. I'm sure that we should do far more. Uh, because you've had to truncate your trip, you're going to miss, and I regret this very much, your visit to my home state of California. And I want to commend you on your decision to cancel your meetings with the United States Senate. <laughs> Getting back to those fires and global warming, um, 
These fires have emitted, I believe it's 1.6 gigatons of carbon into our atmosphere so far. And um, that could put Indonesia uh, on the road this year to have more carbon emissions uh, than India. I think when you look at what we've committed, $2.75 million to help you fight these fires, uh, and you say the amazing effect that could have on reducing climate change, $2.2 million, that's barely legal fees for one side in a dispute about a single EPA regulation. So, um, and when it comes to, to peat, we have a, an especially, uh, especially strong interest because when there's a forest fire, uh, plants that are growing above the ground, they burn, but then there can be reforestation of the area and that carbon can be recaptured. The peat that is burning in Indonesia is hundreds or thousands of years old and uh, its destruction is a permanent addition to carbon uh, in our atmosphere. And uh, the president has taken steps that are considered uh, bold by your local press. I want to urge you uh, to do uh, more. But uh, uh, we in the developed world also share some responsibility. Uh, that palm oil is coming to Europe and the United States as much as anywhere else. And it is important uh, that it not be the product of slash and burn agriculture, particularly involving uh, peat. Um, I uh, wish to, um, well, I've only got 15 more minutes of speech. Um, but rather than hear from me, uh, you can turn on C-SPAN any late night when you suffer from insomnia and do that. Uh, we are here to hear from President Widodo, the President of Indonesia. Is the speaking institution, Mr. Brett Sermon, Congressman, Miss Ladies and Gentlemen, good morning. It is an honor for me to be here today on behalf of the government and people of Indonesia. I would like to thank the Brookings Institution for organizing this event today. Ladies and gentlemen, we meet here today during an ongoing downturn in the emerging markets. How do I view the emerging markets downturn, which has also hit Indonesia hard? I am sad to see my people suffer. I regret that we, as an economy, were not ready to anticipate the fundamental change around us. But, in a way, I welcome this donation as an opportunity. Opportunity to push through difficult, painful, long overdue reforms. We should remember the seeds of our success are often planted during the downturns. What are the reforms challenge that we in Indonesia need to tackle? There are many, but today I will name only two for illustration. Most of you who follow Indonesia know that our infrastructure lag behind. I have spoken 
extensively already about our infrastructure ambitions. Therefore, I do not need to cover again here today the large numbers of ports, dams, and highways uh, uh, we are uh, building. I will report to you today that our intra program is now progressing very well. With our infrastructure program ruling, we then turn our attention to the next urgent reform. And that is to free up our private sector, both domestic and foreign, from poorly conceived policies, excessive permit permitting and licensing, and misguided protectionism, which have caused our companies and industries to suffer for too long. About seven weeks ago, I launched what we call deregulation package number one. This package of policies comprises 134 rules and regulations which we will revise, rationalize, and reform or reform. This was followed around three weeks ago by the regulation package number two. And since then, we have also announced the regulation package number three, the regulation package number four, and the regulation package number five. We are now working on the regulation package number six. Ladies and gentlemen, the more we look at the system of permits, licenses, and regulations, the more we found misguided, inconsistent, and even absurd policies. Rationalization and deregulation of policies is something which we will attack with our full commitment. Like our infrastructure program, our deregulation program is a policy direction which shall continue for as long as it takes like our infrastructure program, it will gain momentum and reach full speed in coming months. And as there is indication for our seriousness to reform our economy, we announced yesterday our intention to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership TPP. To be honest, I think President Obama was a little surprised. <laughs> Dear distinguished audience, today I would like to use this opportunity to speak about the environment. This year we are suffering forest fires across a large part of Indonesia. This is a huge challenge, but we are committed to find solution to the problem, and we will be working with our partners in the region to this end. Let me assure you that we, Indonesia, care deeply about the environment. We are a maritime nation. We have 52,000 kilometers, around 33,000 miles of coastline, which would be affected by rising ocean levels. Please understand, our ocean were suffering, and that is why Earlier this year, we launched a 
major crackdown on illegal fishing. By cracking down on illegal fishing, we pay a heavy short-term price for our economy. But I can tell you, if we had not cracked down on illegal fishing, then within six to seven years, there would be no more fish in our ocean. There would be no more coral, no more marine ecosystem. You shall see a greater focus on the environment from my government going forward. We will reduce our emission. We look forward to working with all the parties at the next COP21 meeting in Paris. We are committed to preserve our forests. We will also continue our zero tolerant policy against illegal fishing. Ladies and gentlemen, in confronting our many challenges, fortunately, Indonesia has two important assets with stabilize and anchor our society. First, Islam. Second, democracy. Indonesia is the largest Muslim majority country in the world, and ours is a strongly moderate and tolerant form of Islam. We are also the third largest democracy in the world. We are proud that Islam in Indonesia plays an important role in consolidating democracy, acts as a guardian of pluralism and tolerance, speaks a powerful voice of moderation in our society, works against radicalism and violent extremism, Indonesia democracy is maturing. Our democracy guarantees every citizen the freedom of speech. By the way, freedom after the speech is also guaranteed. Indeed, our media and social media have been instrumental in exposing corruption and demanding result from our government official. Our democracy guarantees public participation is every aspect of our lives. Only in a democracy, the people are free to choose their leaders. Without democracy, there is no President Joko Widodo. You can tweet. <laughs> I believe as Europe and America are dealing with an influx of people of different religion and races, we in Indonesia have something very special to offer to the world. Indonesia offers a successful model that shows that Islam is compatible not only with democracy but also with modernity. As a power between the Pacific and Indian Ocean, Indonesia future depends on how we manage the sea for the benefit of our people. That is why we launched our global maritime program as a strategic and policy framework. We believe that the sea should remain good. We reject any attempt by any state to control and dominate the sea and turning it into an arena for strategic competition. The sea should be safe, secure, and free 
for seaborne trade. The sea is a source of livelihood for our people. It is a common heritage that needs to be preserved and protected. We believe that the sea should unite, not divide us. Development in the short China Sea also capture our attention. Tensions in the area must be diffused through peaceful means, especially based on unclosed. Indonesia is not a party to the dis dispute, but we have legitimate interest in peace and stability there. That is why we call all parties to exercise restraint and refrain from taking action that could undermine trust and confidence and put at risk the peace and stability of the region. We need to talk closely to ensure good order at sea, prevent incidents, and ensure freedom of navigation. As I often said before, Indonesia stands ready to play an active role in finding solution to the short China Sea problem. We believe it is time for ASEAN and China to start discussing the element of the Code of Conduct, COC, in the short China Sea. As a part of our attention to transform Indonesia into a maritime fulcrum, we recognize the growing importance importance of the Indian Ocean. We will chair Eura and we will produce an Eura Concord. Ladies and gentlemen, as we look out across the East Asia region today, we would like to state our following beliefs. Indonesia will stay true to its free and active foreign policy. ASEAN is of critical importance to us. We will preserve and strengthen ASEAN centrality. We will safeguard ASEAN strategic autonomy from great power competition. We need to strengthen regional multilateral institution such as the East Asia Summit as a strategic platform for dialogue and cooperation. We welcome a sustained and comprehensive U.S. movement in East Asia. The region will benefit from America political, strategic, and most importantly, economic engagement. We recognize that many or even most of today's challenges require global solution. Our constitution says that Indonesia must play an national role to contribute to the global public goods. Therefore, Indonesia is committed to fulfilling our international obligation. For example, we are aiming to increase our participation in peacekeeping operation. We hope to contribute 4,000 troops by 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where it becomes critical for both the United States and Indonesia to work together to achieve great things. During this visit, President Obama and I have launched a new platform, a partnership to uh, a partnership that covers economy, security, environment, technology, and counterterrorism. 
under this platform, both countries can convey genuine strategic interest and strategic concern in clear and strategic manner. This platform will elevate our Fletra relationship into the next level, a uh, strat level. Ladies and gentlemen, there is one bright spot. When I look at today, young generation, I become highly optimistic. They are getting hate right. They are on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We also have our own champion in Indonesia, companies like Kaskus, Gojek, Tokopedia. That is why I was planning to go that paragon of American future. Silicon Valley. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished audience, in, con in conclusion, please take another look at Indonesia. Things are changing very fast. We are not going away. We are not becoming inward looking. Our interest in regional and international engagement remains as strong as ever and will be stronger in the years to come. Our foreign policy will continue to reflect both our national interest and our international obligation. We will bring prosperity to the Indonesian people. We will work with our partners to bring peace to the Asia Pacific. We will fulfill our obligation to create a better world. This is our strategic responsibility to the Indonesian people, to the region, and to the world. Thank you. President Wadodo, thank you very much for that comprehensive and very clear speech. Um, I think that your recognition of the imperative ref of reform in your country uh, is highly important. Your vision of a, an Indonesia that is more active uh, and constructive in world affairs is very significant. So uh, I think I can speak for all of us that we hope you succeed. Thank you. Um, the people of Indonesia, I think, want you to succeed. Do you have time for a couple of questions? Maybe one or two. One or two? <laughs> well, uh, we'll try. Or three? Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you about China. Um, uh, China's uh, the largest country in East Asia in a number of ways. China presents all of its neighbors with opportunities, but it often uh, creates frictions uh, with its neighbors, sometimes even dangers. So that creates a challenge for any leader like yourself. How are you going to try to balance the opportunities off against uh, the frictions and dangers uh, go going forward? Uh, we see China as an important partner for Indonesia. We need to build strong cooperation with China because we send many of commodities to China. We export many of our commodities to China.
we also see other countries such as United States, Russia, Japan, Middle East, Europe, as an also important partner for Indonesia. And about the South China Sea. I thought already in my speech that Indonesia is not a part of the conflict. Mm -hmm. We need peace and stability in the region. And we want ASEAN countries and China to start discussing about the content of the COC, mm -hmm. uh, Code of Conduct, to start discussing element by element of the Code of Conduct. And Indonesia want to play uh, an active uh, role in this issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. For the next question, I would like to uh, call on Mr. James Castle. Uh, he is the founder and uh, head of Castle Asia, um, a firm that's based in Jakarta and uh, provides uh, analysis of the business environment uh, in Indonesia for a lot of firms. Jim? Wait, could you take the mic? Thank you, and terima kasih banyak, Pak. Selamat datang di America. We're, we're very happy you're with us. Thank you very much. Uh, my question relates to infrastructure and public-private partnerships. In your talk, you mentioned the progress that you've been making over the past year, and uh, one of the obstacles to that progress is lack of adequate financing, and one of the solutions is public-private partnerships. Uh, these have been slow in forming. The previous government talked about them, but not many were forthcoming. Do you have any advice as to how the private sector, uh, both domestic in Indonesia and internationally, particularly America, can play a more constructive role in Indonesia's infrastructure program? And what, what are some of the reasons uh, uh, that it's been slow? Do you still believe in public-private partnerships? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... I want to test my minister. <laughs> Please answer the question. <laughs> Thank you. But don't speak longer than my speech. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Talbot, Congressman Sherman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, Jim. I think the answer is very much that we absolutely believe in public-private partnership. I think, um, as the President pointed out, it's only been one year. And as many of you know, it's been a very busy year, very eventful, uh, admittedly, sometimes a bit bumpy. Uh, but absolutely, uh, I myself, as a trade minister, um, and I should explain a little bit, uh, in our country, my trade ministry is kind of like a combination of what in the U.S. would be Commerce Department and USTR. So I should cover a lot of domestic commerce. And um, as such, I travel around the country quite a lot to kind of visit regional markets, uh, you know, uh, village markets, uh, and so on, uh, looking at the domestic uh, commerce. And a lot of times I'm surprised, you know, I run into a reservoir that's under construction, or I run into uh, a power plant, like even a micro one. And uh, the point I'm getting to is basically that I, I was per personally quite surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised, by the progress being made on the infrastructure program. It's really something that we're not conveying much or sufficiently, but really I was, I was quite surprised. Uh, I think the reservoirs in particular, uh, there's 16 under construction right now, uh, 65 in total in President Jokowi's program. And um, just one got switched on a couple of weeks ago uh, in Jatikade. 
is going to irrigate 90,000 hectares of rice paddy. Uh, and as many of you might be aware, without irrigation, rice paddies can only be harvested once a year. With irrigation, it can be harvested twice a year. Right, so, um, and uh, another one uh, in West Java also, like the Jetty Kade, uh, was under construction from Korean uh, contractors. And I saw on the billboard, it's actually APPP, seems like, uh, between the government of Indonesia and the Korea Exim Bank. So if Congressman Sherman has some positive news about the reactivation of the US Exim Bank, to me, that's very exciting news. Uh, and also you explain about the uh, over plan in Batang. This also yes. PPP. <laughs> That's right. Um, so indeed, uh, <laughs> oh, tough, without running over my time limit. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, uh, so Batang Power Station um, is a, a PPP. It's designed to be the largest coal-fired power station in Southeast Asia once it's completed. And uh, some of the principals are actually here with us. So perhaps after the event, you can discuss with them. But uh, uh, again, it was a project that was stuck for many, many years. And once again, President Jokowi's specialty, you know, things which people say are impossible, like he just gets in there, hands on, into the field. And lo and behold, it can be done. So um, and that's a huge PPP, actually. Uh, I think it's more than three or four billion dollars. Um, but as the president always says, these things take time. They take a process. Uh, but personally, uh, you know, many of you know I come from a finance background, so I'm very much a numbers guy. And uh, the way I look at the program is it goes from two to four, four to eight, eight to 16, 16 to 32, 32 to 64. So these things tend to be slow to, to gain momentum, but once they do, you know, the, uh, the snowballing, the magic of compounding can be quite stunning. So it's certainly something that the economy, I believe, can look forward to. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I was impressed with this exchange at uh, how good a chief executive you are. Uh, you, you know how to delegate responsibility without giving up power. <laughs> um, for the next question, I would like to call on Ambassador David Merrill. He um, previously served the United States uh, in the Republic of Indonesia. Uh, the mic's coming. Um, David, it's very nice to have you with us. Mr. President, your administration has emphasized the importance of people-to-people -to -people relations, including close relationships between you and your own people as well as a people-to-people -people dimension as part of your global diplomacy. As you seek ways to strengthen the U.S.-Indonesia, or I should say Indonesia-U.S. strategic partnership over the next five years, what role do you see for the greater participation by civil society groups in both countries? Thank you. <laughs> I want to test again my minister, foreign minister. Please answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Hopefully then I will be able to pass the standard of the president to <laughs> explain to you about the, uh, to respond to uh, David's uh, question about the track two. Mr. President, David and I is already uh, working together uh, uh, for years in developing the participation of the uh, track uh, two in uh, strengthening in our effort to strengthening the, the bilateral relation with the US. As a modern and democratic uh, country, I think it is almost impossible to set aside the track two in our uh, undertaking. That is, of course, including in our uh, effort in strengthening cooperation with the United States. If you look at the Indonesia-United States relation, we uh, recall that in 2010, we developed the uh, strategic partnership in which the track to including, or especially on the education, uh, contributed a lot in our effort to strengthen the bilateral uh, relation. Now, as the president mentioned, and yesterday in the conversation with President Obama, 
two presidents agreed to bring the bilateral relation into a higher level by having the strategic partnership. Again, it is not impossible that the track two will be in again, playing a great role in developing the, the uh, partnership, the cooperation between Indonesia and the US. The strategic partnership will not change anything that has been developed in the comprehensive partnership, but rather it will strengthen the effort that's already been done by the comprehensive partnership. Is it enough, Mr. President? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I should have mentioned that Ambassador Merrill is also the president of the US Indonesia Society and play, making a major contribution in Washington, D.C. to an understanding of your country. Um, I understand, Mr. President, that my main responsibility as moderator <laughs> is to make sure that you leave for your next function on time. <laughs> and I will uh, fulfill that obligation. But I did want to say um, just one thing in conclusion. I was very struck with what you said about Islam being compatible with democracy, Islam being compatible with modernization. Um, I think these are very important insights, um, and they are important not just in Indonesia, but around the world. But the future of democracy will be much better served and have much greater promise if Indonesia succeeds. And uh, so, we wish you all the best in your effort to um, ensure that Indonesia is a strong and su successful uh, Muslim democracy. Please join me in thanking President. Thank you.